Uh, good morning to all you fine uh, E folks out there. That's internet folk, by the way. Uh, I was sent a, a little story here via instant messaging by a somewhat unusual fellow. I will read this to you. It says, care for some more fiction and inside it, this it writes about the this person has a friend who, I guess, writes uh, erotic literature or something. And there was an Earl, a link or whatever the hell you want to call it in there. So I followed it, and it's quite interesting. It's a homoerotic piece of fiction here. I don't know. I guess it's kind of like emo, too, or something. It's about some dude dying of cancer and his gay boyfriend who likes to anally, uh, you know, anally uh, enter him every night. So this is the story. It's entitled Don't Cry for Chicago. Don't Cry for Chicago. Word count, 1407. I'm not going to be reading all the words because, you know, I, <laughs> you know, I just ate breakfast. I don't feel like, uh, you know, putting it all over my keyboard. So cue the music, please. Patrick doesn't look at it as giving up. He just knows when he's beaten and has the grace to go down with his dignity. Pete pleads with him to continue the chemo. Cries, begs, threatens to leave. But that only backfires when Patrick shrugs and gestures to the door. Pete doesn't know he, or Pete knows he doesn't mean it, that Patrick is only trying to get his point across, but that doesn't stop him from putting his fist through the hallway drywall and crying until he wants to puke on the hardwood floor. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Patrick comes to his rescue, but waits him out in the living room until Pete comes to him with pale skin and red eyes, sniffling and cradling his already bruised hand to his chest. They curl up together on the couch, and Pete wouldn't deny if someone accused him of just crying silently a little more. Patrick has been his entire life for ten years. He's allowed to come apart at the seams. Okay. Some nights, Patrick's just too sore or too tired, but tonight, he's the one pulling Pete on top of him, sealing their mouths together and pulling at their clothes. Pete fucks him slowly, pulling his fingers together and pressing the backs of Patrick's hands to the pillow beneath him and stopping every once in a while to regain his ability to hold off. Patrick's just as hot and desperate, even more so now, under him arching and panting and biting at Pete's lip when Pete tries to speak. He doesn't want to hear it, doesn't want to hear anything Pete might say at this moment because he might be withering on the inside, but right now, right now, Pete inside him, and he's looking at him all shiny, and he's like they're brand new, and uh, back of the van a few years ago, he's alive. The only time he allows Pete to speak, to whisper in his ear, is when he comes. Patrick knows what he says, just like every time he does. And even though he can't quite make out the syllables of the choked whimpers of Pete's orgasm, the I love you is just as present as it was the first time. It always will be. Patrick holds him close, letting Pete's body cover his sticky and hot one afterwards. It's the only way of either of them getting any sleep anymore. But Patrick doesn't mind spending whatever's time left like this. Good night.